attention, you bastards. Yes, yes, yes. Trap like records. Trap like records. <laughs> yeah, it's on 18. I see what's trapping. Oh, gee. You know what's going on with us. Yeah. That way. Jeff's Beats Production. Growing up, it was hard, nigga. Hard. Going hard, nigga. Shooting dice. And them hogs, nigga. Selling raw, nigga. Fuck the law. Break the law, nigga. Break the law, nigga. We go dumb, we go dumb, nigga. Straight retard, nigga. Yellow bus, cut the coke, nigga. Cut the coke, nigga. Trap life, I'm a trap, nigga. And I trap, nigga. And I trap. Keep a hundred round, that's a hundred rounds. Lay it down, that's some shit together. We don't play around. Never been a book, nigga, or a school, nigga. Or a school, never been a fraud, nigga. Or a geek, nigga. Never been a lame, nigga. Or a fraud, nigga. Never been a book, nigga, or a school, nigga. or a school. Never been a fraud, nigga, never or a been a fraud. Never been a lame, nigga, nigga. or a fraud, nigga. Straight nigga. round, drawn, nigga. We go dumb with it. Never been a book. Never been a book, nigga, or a school, nigga. Or a school. Never been a fraud, We have CSI today, cold case, uh, NCSI, all of these uh, crime scene investigation uh, television shows that are on. And if I'm not uh, mistaken, one of them takes place right here in Las Vegas. How amazing that Las Vegas themselves are not doing the same thing that the television shows are portraying, solving a murder case. Occam, a 14th century teacher of logic said, all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. In the case of Tupac, it turned out to be the truth. Stories of civil wars in the gang community, lone gunmen, and vengeance of a friend all make for great writing and drama. But in the case of Tupac, the simplest story fits all the elements. I'm coming forward with the information because someone asked me and I was willing to tell them what I knew. No one, in the, no one in the past has ever asked me anything about Tupac, even though when you look at the MTV Music Award tapes, and when you look at his whole last week, you'll see me there. I was there in Vegas when he was shot. I was one of the first people to the hospital, but I was never interviewed by anyone. So I'm just coming forth now to, to set it the record straight that some of the things that happened to Tupac, we need to check within death row before we start pointing the fingers at other people. Mike Allen is a former prosecuting attorney for Hamilton County, Ohio. He has also worked as a judge in the city of Cincinnati, an expert in the field of prosecution and witness testimony. Mike Allen has led one of the only successful prosecutions against the Roman Catholic Church for the molestation of children by priests. It is somewhat perplexing as to why a conspiracy case was not presented to the grand jury, because again, keep in mind, the standard at the grand jury level is probable cause. It's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now a homicide detective living in Warren County, Ohio, Lieutenant Jeff Braley is also a police officer. Lieutenant Braley's experience comes with the military and federal law enforcement. The elements of an assassination cannot be discussed with just anyone. Lieutenant Braley agreed to help explain the elements involved. This type of planned killing has happened all over the world. About to see the most amazing pictures ever made. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia. It's a gala day in Marseille. Vive Alexander! Vive Laura! Oh, they've been shot! 
you know, we see example, example, even on film sometimes, uh, you know, some of our movies have even set up the same exact plan where you run a car on one side that creates a diversion, a shooter comes up on another side. Um, it's happened all over the world. It's happened for so many years we can't count them. It's going to continue to happen in the future of this same type. But there's always so many specific elements to that plan, even though it almost looks normal, uh, as terminology used, garden variety, you know, there's a lot of planning and intent that goes into that. Um, it's, it's an easy hit. Kathy Scott, an investigative reporter, has been covering the ongoing Tupac investigation since the evening of the shooting, an accomplished writer. Kathy published her insight on the investigation in her book, The Killing of Tupac Shakur. I um, covered crime in San Diego as a reporter and came to Las Vegas in 1993 as a uh, police uh, politics first and then a police reporter. And... Um, was working for the Las Vegas Sun as a reporter and when Tupac Shakur was shot and he was shot on my watch. My name is Napoleon, former member of the Outlaws, the Tupac Outlaws. Yeah, I met Pac through Gaddafi, <clears throat> who was a half-brother of Pac. And me and Gaddafi, we was childhood friends. The guy could grab an audience and 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 he, he was becoming a spokesman for the black community. The guy could go into a room and light it up. He's got a huge fan base, to, and he will forever. And I think people want answers. When it was a planned killing, I don't believe that there's no way you could classify it as a random act of violence. You have all the elements in place that show that there was a plan there in place to eliminate this particular person. They're pretty good dudes if they pick that spot to do it with that kind of traffic. Brent Becker was one of the original homicide detectives working for the Las Vegas Police Department when a call came in regarding a shooting. That was a random opportunity. They happened to be there, and that's how it worked out. And just coincidentally, some gunman sticks his arm out of a white Cadillac and shoots the biggest rapper in America. Why didn't they shoot anybody else? Donnie Rath, retired LAPD investigator, lives not far from the West Valley Division of the LAPD, where the first hints of the notorious LAPD Rampart scandal started. E. Rath was first in the LAPD to be awarded the Los Angeles Police Department's Distinguished Service Award Medal. I see this as a typical uh, assassination if we have a homicide and we know that it was something that was planned, we're going to start interviewing people, you know, whether it's weeks, months, or years prior, basically whatever it takes to find the inception of that plan. Whose idea was it to kill this person? Why did they want them dead? And when did they start talking about it? Background information would be garnered, would be gathered by the lead investigator and by those helping him uh, as to establish a motive, as to establish possible suspects. But in this situation, because the players were were a little bit more notorious, were a little bit more known. The background should have already have been known. Chip Knight was captain of the football team and he got in trouble a little bit while he was here. He had an arrest record. He lived here for a few years and liked the town and came back and bought a place. It's the summer of 1996. All Eyes on Me has reached quintuple platinum status. Tupac gets to see his first number one single. His next album, to be released in November of 96, is called Machiavelli, or The Seven Day Theory. It's recorded in a record seven days. Tupac was considered by industry leaders to be at the top of his recording game. And with over 120 unreleased master tapes, who could argue? The first time it was made aware to me that there was a problem with Tupac and Death Row was on the set of Gridlock. Yasmin, who was Yak Fula's mom, was Tupac's uh, assistant. And she had called, uh, called me that evening and said, I'm gonna come down to the set. I need to talk to you and Kevin Hackey about some things that's going on with Pac in Death Row. She didn't go into any great details about anything. And she told us, basically, to step up our game and watch him. Park was going to start his own record label, Machiavelli Records, and I don't know if it was going to be distributed through Death Row Records or he was going to do it on his own, but it was a label that he was working on, and we was going to outlaws, we was going to sign with that label, Machiavelli Records. I got a call from Al Giddens. I was at home. I lived in Orange County. And Al Giddens says to me, hey, 
um, you need to get to the studio because Pac is trying to, you know, take masters out of the uh, studio. And Suge has told us that no one is to take masters from the studio anymore. He called me specifically knowing that I was Pac's bodyguard, saying, hey, you need to get down here. You need to talk to him. Uh, you need to calm him down. He's cussing. He's going off. He's going crazy. Master Tapes, the lifeblood of the music industry. From these original recordings, copies can be made for distribution. Master Tapes are very important to an artist. Control of the Master Tapes means control of the revenue they generate. Tupac Shakur wanted his Master Tapes. If he had obtained them, it may have been trouble for Death Row Records. Recent court documents from artists who have sued Death Row in the last few years speak of a trend of Death Row holding on to master tapes. Tupac knew what he needed if he were to break away. The problem for Death Row may have been that these tapes were mortgaged. We know that Death Row had money loaned to them from Interscope. If those tapes, whose value is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, were removed from Death Row, it may have led to a break in the relationship between Death Row at Interscope. Even if we consider the royalties to be earned a secret worth lying for, consider this. At the time of his death, attorneys for Shakur's estate claim there was over $13 million owed to artists like Shakur for work already done. Not just the singer, but the technicians, board operators, musicians, all owed money. And Death Row had not paid them. It was before he went to New York that he was thinking about starting Machiavelli Records. No promises, promises made to be broken. I might get hit by a car and go to jail. I'm not gonna say that. Knight entrusted the protection of the artist to former and current police officers and fire department officials. Of course, not all of the police hired by Reggie Wright were model citizens. The arrests of David Mack and Rafael Perez showed a new level of corruption in the L.A. Police Department. And both were on death row's payroll. But not all of the bodyguards were corrupt. And surprisingly enough, not all of the bodyguards have been interviewed by Las Vegas police. I um, started working with uh, Rightway Security in September of uh, 1995. Yeah, I worked with Rightway Security, not with Death Row Records, and Rightway was employed by Death Row Records. 96 is when I came on, I believe. It was either late 95, November, December, or early 96. I started working for Death Row back in 1994 and later became a bodyguard. Michael Moore was my replacement for Pac that weekend at the um, MTV Awards in New York. Uh, I was mostly a fill-in when I was guarding, you know, with Tupac. Uh, personally, I didn't like him. I was in a limo, uh, me and Tupac, Outlaw Mortals. We were driving around in Harlem and the radio came on with Snoop Dogg saying that he had no beef with New York, which sent Pac into a rage. And we immediately spun the limo around, and we went back to the hotel to confront Snoop. We couldn't find him, but we found uh, Mr. Knight. Tupac was displeased about what had happened, and Mr. Knight was very upset, and they got to yelling at each other back and forth. They confronted each other, basically to a face-to-face. -face. I did slide in between them and said, hey, you know, you can't do this while I'm here, or I am going to have to step out of the room. Normally, I am asked in every situation that I can remember while working with Death Row, where there was altercations, fights, where some type of discipline was going to be passed out during Death Row, I'm usually asked to step outside the room. Uh, but on this occasion, I think Mr. Knight had me stay for the safety of Tupac. I mean, that's the reason I was there, because I think Mr. Knight, with me not being there, he would have put his hands on him. He was that upset. They're going to be a great one. It's because most of people in that position, they've been trained in that area. They have knowledge of safety procedures to keep someone safe. And, and they have a lot of good gut feelings about what could go wrong. And Pac's words were, I'm going to, I'm going to cut out Machiavelli. And when I cut out Machiavelli, I'm the hell up out of here. You got your money. I don't want nothing else to do with death row. I'm out. That's how we left that day. There was all kinds of alleged baggage involved as far as Tupac wanting to leave Death Row Records. 
and he was screaming Machiavelli at the top of his lungs. That bodyguard that was pulled off is prime to the investigation. Not only the reasons for them being pulled off, but what led up to their being pulled off and what information days prior they were privy to. You don't discount that information. And at the time in New York, I think we had just finished doing um, MTV and he had to come back to LA, I think, to do a video. And he didn't want it to go because he was like uneasy about going. He said he didn't want it to go. Because he had told us that he was not going there with his words, them sell out niggas. I was told by another one of our security guards that was a bodyguard that he had escorted Pot to the airplane as they were leaving New York and Tupac told him specifically told him that he was a dead man walking the last thing he said to me prior to leaving was he's not gonna be in Vegas I don't have to worry about him showing up and don't worry about it because he won't be there he didn't feel like he didn't want to go to Vegas he didn't even, I don't even think he wanted to do the video I think Tupac wanted to leave and I don't think Death Row wanted him to go Tupac was to attend the Mike Tyson Bruce Seldon fight. I arrived at uh, Las Vegas the day before uh, Pac did on a Friday. September 6th, 1996. He did not want to go to Vegas. Matter of fact, he fought off going to Vegas all the way to the last second. And when I got there, I was surprised to see him there. We met at an attorney's house. George Kalisas. George Kalisis was the attorney for Club 662. Kalisis was a prominent attorney in Las Vegas, known for Clark County judges who owed him money. In fact, several cases that were represented by Kalisis' firm were awarded favorable decisions, and at no time did the judges make it known that they were in literal debt to Kalisis. And on the subject of not knowing, it was a common conception that Knight owned Club 662 when he did not. Like many of the death row legends, this is also a lie. Reggie asked me to ride with him to the meeting. I was actually going to ride with Michael Moore. He began to tell me about uh, how he was upset at Kevin Hackey and that Kevin Hackey had my Nextel two-way uh, you know, cell phone radio that should have been given to me when I arrived in Vegas. It's huge. You know, one of the things you'll see throughout history, in, even in, in, in a military assassination, is the fact that let's take out communications. The same is true in, 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 in an assassination, in, in the, uh, the elimination of a single person. Let's make sure that they can't call for help. Let's make sure that they can't communicate with each other. If they're in trouble, why would we want them to be able to tell anyone what's actually going on? <laughs> Ask somebody Chinese, if you're watching this tape, don't just say two egg rolls. <laughs> To go <laughs> with hot sauce. <laughs> and I would just say, <laughs> niggas ain't Chinese, get Chinese letters like they've been somewhere and shit. You ain't never let the block, nigga. Let's isolate them, keep them away from their protection, take away their communication back to whoever can help them, isolate that victim, you're going to have a more successful mission. One cannot ignore the ability to communicate. We're in an instant communication era. And for a detective to ignore the possibility is, in my mind, ridiculous. George Kalisas called the meeting at the behest of Reggie Wright Jr. All of the bodyguards were there. Never before had we had a meeting at an attorney's office or with an attorney even present. Reggie Wright told us not to carry any weapons. Never have they told me to leave my weapons, either in my room or my car. So they were asking us to guard Pac and Suge and everyone else completely unarmed. We had never been told to leave our weapons. For an attorney to do that, I don't know why. We had had a meeting at Club 662, a security meeting, because for security we had uh, on you know any given weekend that we were going to be in Las Vegas with all of the artists and when they were going to be performing or we we're going to be at a fight, there would be 20, 23 uh, you know, security members from Right Way Security. So now I'm in a situation where I'm being asked to guard a park without any weapons or a phone. Since I wasn't there to know what was said, I don't know what their 
reason was for it. If you cannot defend yourself, you're going to be an easier target for me. You know, if, if you're my intended victim and you carry a gun, I have to plan completely differently than if you did not. So if I can get you to be unaware of the danger, if I can get you not to carry the gun or have uh, any personnel with you that are armed, you're that much of an easier victim and an easier hit. That's a great part of the plan if you could accomplish that to get rid of any firearms because as the hitter, as the shooter, as the planner, you're protecting yourself. It was a special meeting. He was called in to be at his office on a Saturday to meet with all of us. Why would I leave my weapons in a vehicle or in the hotel room and I'm personally guarding Pac in one of the most hottest places to be? And what that's going to make it is a body guarding incident where you would be, only thing you would have on you is your person. And Michael Moore made the, you know, biggest, uh, you know, who are about the weapons. I informed Reggie that I wasn't taking my weapon off for no one. The thong, my gun did not belong to right wet. It was my personal gun and I was going to carry it and that's what I did. Metropolitan Police in Las Vegas were on Shook Knight's payroll that night moonlighting. And I would think that those guys who were hired by Shug and were with him that night would have been interviewed by the police. But I, I mean, maybe they know something. Everywhere you went, there was like this tightness that nobody wanted to, it was almost like anybody was, people were afraid to talk about the case. I mean, there was a weird sort of ring around the investigation that was tough to penetrate. I don't own, and none of the other bodyguards own, the security company. So when you're given a um, direct directive to do something, you have to follow it. And if you don't, possibly you could have, you know, cost you your job. So if Reggie owns the security company and he tells us what we need to do, then we need to do it. I think I think maybe Pac became a little bit bigger on security once he fell in love with Frank Alexander. Well, if I tell like Frankie to call you and then you Frankie, say, is that what you said? Yeah. Frankie? Yeah, tell Frankie to call me. <laughs> Frankie, you call me when she tells you to call me Frankie. <laughs> Frankie goes to Hollywood. Hey, yo, Frankie. Frankie. Yo, Frankie. Why did he this food? What? Y'all call him Frankie? Now we're going to call him Frankie. Only, only our family call us that. Call me that. Frankie. Now we call him Frankie. Yo, Frankie. We got him, y'all. Frankie Knuckles. Frankie Knuckles up in this room. No, no, baby. Frankie Knuckles. No, what I just want. What y'all call him? Straight up. Frankie. Oh. Now the E sound real extra, because you know Frank a little extra sexy in the E. Too sexy for some sleeves. <laughs> 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 Earlier that evening, after the uh, meeting at the uh, attorney's office, uh, Reggie said, hey, Pac is back at the uh, Lexor. I'm going to go drop you off, go meet up with him. So he dropped me off. I saw Pac and all of the outlaws. I went over, you know, hugged him, greeted him and everything. And, uh, you know, Pac said, hey, Big Frank, how was your vacation, man? I was like, it's cool, man, you know. So uh, he had been gambling. He was actually uh, shooting craps at the Lexor. We had a dinner meeting, excuse me, make that a lunch meeting. Uh, and thank God it's Fridays, I believe. Uh, in Las Vegas prior to the fight starting and I was asked, I was told that I'd be taken off uh, Tupac Shakur. You put Tupac at risk when you remove two body, one bodyguard and say, hey Frank, you handle him. So for most of the day, all this went on and Tupac did not have a clue that's what we were doing. I was a little upset that I was taken off of him and I got into a little argument with Reggie Wright at lunch over it. He said, Mike, I'm putting Frank back on him and I'm taking you back off. And I said, Reggie, that part doesn't make sense. Why not leave me and Frank on Tupac? And he said, Michael Moore, do what you're told. I'm gonna put you at Club 662 and you're gonna handle the security along with Al Giddens at the club. And, you know, Pac is Pac. He said, hey, let's go. And we go, where are we going? He goes, uh, we're gonna go over to the MGM. And I'm like, well, are we going to get a cab or how are we going to get over there? He goes, no, no, we're going to walk over there. It's plenty of times he was alone without a bodyguard. We walked in the malls without bodyguards. Pac was that type of guy, you know? He wasn't always relying on a bodyguard. He wasn't like that. I think the reason they removed me 
from Tupac. This was because I was one of the few people that wouldn't buy into not carrying your weapon. And during no part of that day did I take my weapon off. And Mr. Wright knew that. So they removed me off Tupac so there wouldn't be a weapon there. So Michael Moore, myself, and all of the outlaws with Tupac walk from the Lexor to the MGM. Uh, during our conversation on the way back from the MGM Grand, I explained to Tupac that Mr. Wright was taking me off of him earlier that day. He was a little upset. He made a couple phone calls. We get to the MGM again. He goes to a crap table, and the MGM was a little bit, uh, you know, more crowded uh, that that evening while he was gambling. He was gambling. He was, you know, winning. He was doing good. And um, Pac said to me, "Go over." call Reggie and find out what time Suge wants to meet to go into the fight. Tupac asked me to go make the call. I didn't have a radio, I couldn't contact Reggie, so I had to go to a landline phone. So I go to call. As I went to call on a landline phone, I came back to the uh, table and they were all gone. Uh, during our conversation on the way back from the MGM Grand, I explained to Tupac that Mr. Wright was taking me off of him earlier that day. And I walked him all the way to his room. So I'm walking all over the MGM looking for him before I could even realize he isn't even in the building. And I explained he's a real impatient person. I walked him to his room and my understanding was he was supposed to wait there till other security got to him. I get back over to the Lexor and I'm looking all around for him. I'm on his uh, phone uh, calling trying to find him. and. Uh, Pac walks up behind me. I'm like, Pac, where, where you been, man? I'm uh, looking all over for you guys over to uh, MGM. He's like, oh, we walked back over here. I was ready to go. So I went to my room, and that was actually the last. I didn't have no knowledge he was downstairs in the lobby until Frank Alexander called me and said, hey, Mike, why is Tupac down here? And I even believe on the phone, I explained to Frank, even then, I am not on Tupac. I kept trying to say that the only person that was assigned to Tupac at that time was Frank Alexander. We had an issue with our clothes. Me and Frank had on short pants that day. We needed to change our clothes to get in the right thing, the right clothes for the fight. But there were some problems there because with me not really being on Tupac, the person who really needed to change his clothes was Frank. So I called Michael Moore on the house phone and said, hey, get back down here because uh, Pac is, you know, getting ready to want to, you know, take off and everything and he's uh, upset about Reggie. Have you talked to Reggie? So we let Frank go change his clothes while I waited. Then Frank changed his clothes, came back and picked up on Pac, and then I went back to my room. To this day, I believe that Tupac was under the impression that I was going to be going to the MGM Grand with him. But that wasn't the case. When I went to my room, I knew in my heart, I wasn't coming back because I had been instructed to go to Club 662, and that's what I did. He got a little upset because now that I think back on it, he said he's paying for this shit and that he is telling us where we're going. I remember him saying that real loud that day in the lobby, that I'm paying for you, you go where I say go. And then I said, Frank, you need to make a phone call to Reggie. And Pac said, Michael, come over to the uh, MGM and meet us over there. Tupac even called Reggie and had Frank get in, call, in touch with Reggie to find out where Michael Moore was at. So the problem was festering and I knew something wasn't right. So when I went to my hotel room, I told Tim Williams, something is not right here, Tim. What we have to do is find out what's going on. So I said, let me go downstairs and I'll change clothes and I'll work with Tupac until Reggie says something. Tim said, Mike, don't do it. He goes, you're gonna piss Reggie off, don't do it. I go, Tim, Frank's gonna need some help. He said, don't do it, just get dressed and go to the club. I think Frank had no idea that I received him four phone calls uh, prior to Tupac getting killed. While we were at the MGM out in um, the you know, arena right there waiting to go in. I had the regular security escort us behind the line. Three of the phone calls came from Mr. Wright and one phone call came from Al Giddens, who was also head of 662 security. And I asked him, I go, Al, why are you calling my room at 
10 after, you know, 10 after 8, if I'm not supposed to be there till 10. And his answer was, Reggie just called me and told me to call you. I said, well, don't call me no more. And then after that, all my phone calls came directly from Mr. Wright. You know, people saw Pac, they were, Tupac, that's Tupac, you know. And we're waiting for Michael Moore to show up. At that point in time, I had lost all communication with Michael Moore. I didn't know whether he was coming, uh, what was going on, or anything. I think there was a reason for that. And I think the reason was making sure that no one carried a weapon. Pac was real antsy. He was like, where's Suge at? Where's Suge? Why come Suge ain't here? You know, he's looking at the, at the time and stuff, and he's getting closer for the fight to start at this point. People are going in. Well, we got down to the MGM right in the front of it, right where the fight was at, and I was getting ready to get out of the car. I rode with Tim Williams over there. He goes, Mike, what are you doing? I said, Tim, I should just get out. Because if Reggie yells at me and I'm covering Tupac, how bad can that be? Well, at the last second, I decided to just stay in the car. I went to Club 662. Tupac and Alexander are alone in a crowd with no radio or weapon. I think this needs to be let out. To me, that's the beginning of our downfall. Shook got there with uh, a couple of you know people that was with him, whoever it was that had the tickets, and we went in to the fight right as the national anthem was playing. Tupac was to attend the Mike Tyson Bruce Sullivan fight, Vegas's 22nd highest earning fight of all time. The Tyson fight ended in 109 seconds. Tyson won by a knockout. Again, you know, when we talk about the shooters and everything else, you're going to talk about the defense of the shooter to escape after the hit. Now, that defense of that shooter doesn't take place just when the hit occurs. It takes place afterwards, too. And if I can shift blame to someone else, makes, put someone else in a place where they look like they had motive and they had opportunity to make this hit, and it takes the blame off the meat, that adds to my defense. In April of 1996, I got a phone call from uh, Reggie one day, and he was telling me that um, um, Trevon, one of the... Uh, the homeboys uh, hung around the studio. It was one of uh, Shug's uh, guys, is what I call him. Um, got into a altercation in the uh, Lakewood Mall in uh, California, and it was at a Foot Locker store. And he went into this Foot Locker. Orlando Anderson uh, was in there, and Death Row um, people from Death Row, uh, the artists and uh, all of the uh, the homeboy securities, whatever you want to call them, they wore this uh, Death Row emblem of the, uh, uh, like the guy in the electric chair, chair, everybody knows the emblem. Orlando Anderson went up to Trevon and snatched off his uh, emblem, his chain, and they got into this fight in uh, the Lakewood Mall. And they tore up this uh, Foot Locker, where the store that they were in. One thing led to another. Uh, ironically, in September, Orlando Anderson is the gentleman that Tupac got into the altercation with at the MGM. Orlando Anderson is leaning up at a wall watching people come out of the fight. And this is near the food court. And the, and the bank of elevators is where this happened. And then you walk to the um, lobby, through the casino a bit, and then to the lobby. And um, it always struck me as, as that whole thing struck me as odd. Um, and they let him go. He did not have a ticket to the fight. He did tell people at one point and told the police that he had a ticket, but he didn't have a ticket. He did not attend the fight. He's from Compton, he had no reason to be in Las Vegas. Trevon whispered into Tupac's ear right after we walked out of the uh, Mike Tyson um, uh, fight. And Pac took off running, I took off running behind him, and the rest of the entourage ran behind us. Maybe that was a setup. I mean, he was standing there waiting, and lay, waiting for somebody. And then Tupac shows up, and they start exchanging words with his entourage and everybody else, and they start stomping and, and yelling and doing their silly things. But it was odd that, I keep saying odd, but the whole thing is odd. And that's where the, uh, the altercation, the fight broke out between Tupac and uh, Orlando Anderson. I think Orlando Anderson's, um, th that be it, the beating doesn't make sense. I mean, he was kicked and stomped a little bit, you know, and police didn't do anything. They, they didn't even take him downstairs. The police didn't take, or security, take Orlando downstairs, you know, at the MGM to talk to him about that that beating he just said no he didn't he didn't want to press charges and and they sent him on his merry way 
Now, I never knew who Orlando Anderson was. It's just like kind of, you know, funny, ironic, uh, whatever you want to call it, that from April to September, why would Reggie have told me about Trevon getting into this fight at the Foot Locker in Lakewood Ball with Orlando Anderson? And then here we are, you know, a few months later, Pac gets into the same fight with Orlando Anderson at the MGM, and then everything just went from there. Detective Tim Brennan of the Compton Police Department was the first to bring Orlando Anderson's name to the front of the assassination. This affidavit, in support of a search warrant, specifies that Anderson was the likely shooter of Shakur. The shooting was in retaliation for the beating of Anderson at the MGM earlier that evening. Anderson's beating was, in turn, alleged payback for the Lakewood Mall fight that Reggie Wright told Alexander about some time earlier. And then everything just went from there. Planned out. I'm sure there were variations, but yeah, um, Orlando Anderson looks a little um, staged. It looks a little planned out. It all looks as if they were trying to find a killer they could point out afterward. Brennan testifies Trayvon is the person making the clearest and first claim that Anderson was the shooter. Trayvon is said to be telling people within hours of the shooting that Orlando Anderson is the one who shot Tupac. This is the same Trayvon who had the fight with Anderson in Lakewood and the same one who instigated the fight at the MGM. If Trayvon's statement was to be believed by Brennan's affidavit, enough to justify the documentation of it, did Trayvon actually see Anderson in the car? The only way for Trayvon to have known that fact would have been to see the face of the shooter. So why wasn't he identified to police as an eyewitness? Whatever the case, in the face of the mounting physical evidence collected by Compton police, Anderson is not charged. Was Orlando Anderson a patsy? He can't tell us. He was killed two years later, claiming his innocence to the death. Later, it's learned that Trayvon was in the car that pinned Tupac's car from the left side on the street, blocking any escape when the shooting occurred. They're setting someone else to take up the blame for their action. That's also a, a, a very ingenious part of the plan to be able to do that, is the fact that now not only can I take out my intended victim, but I can make it look like somebody else had the same motive and opportunity to do the same act. And why go to all that trouble to stage this kind of event? Certainly, Anderson could have been dealt with more discreetly. Knight went to prison over a beating, a parole violation. But in the poker game of crime, nine years beats life. It also plays towards setting up the final alibi and cover story. Once again, you know, we're going back to an element of the planning. Where are they going to be? Where are you going to plan your hit? Now, you're going to look for an optimum target. I mean, you're going to look for the perfect place. And you're going to make sure that that victim travels across that place. You know, you're not going to want it to be where you're, there's just throngs of public or cars or where you can't get close or things such that. You're going to want it maybe to be a little bit more isolated. Or you're going to want it to not be an exact place to give you maximum exposure for a shot. You're going to want them to be a target, not a hidden target, a target. It. And if you can get them to a spot or crossing a path where you already have people in place, you know, it's going, your, your plan's going to fall into place, so to speak, and you're going to have that shot availability to you. Keep in mind, where the actual shooting happened isn't as full of pedestrian traffic as it would be out on the strip. This, the shooting happened off the strip. A lot of people think it was right on the main drag, and it wasn't. And you don't have the foot traffic where this happened that you do where people cruise. What strip, I mean, the strip is, is going to be crazy, but it's actually stop and go. You can't go fast on the strip on a Saturday fight night. So you're going to hit the strip from the backside, coming up near Mandela Bay from the south end and driving up that way. You hang a ride on Koval and boom, you're, you're, you're about out of hell and gone and off the radar. I mean, that street actually, Koval Lane, is dark at night. You've got to know where they're at, where they're going to be, who they're going to be surrounded by. You're going to have to have a way to get that type of information. An innocent individual that comes in to protect someone, and he's totally set up. He's totally, his communications are denied, his weapons are denied. Frank was set up. 
We went to uh, Suge Knight's home first. Suge changed clothes. After that, we're driving back uh, from where he lived at in Green Valley in Las Vegas. We're going down Las Vegas Boulevard. Another crucial part of your planning is going to be whether or not your victim is aware that he's in danger. If your victim is aware that he's in danger, he's going to make sure that his defense perimeter is there, that his defense is in place. If he's not aware that he's in danger, his guard's going to be let down a little. As we're going down the strip, just before we got to Tropicana, a couple of a bicycle cops uh, stopped Shook. He opened up his trunk, and there was nothing in there. It was a brand new car. He got back in the car. We proceeded to go down to uh, Flamingo. We turned right on Flamingo. As we turned right, and we're sitting at the light on Flamingo of Flamingo and uh, Koval, the white Cadillac then pulled up and the arm came out and fired the rounds from the back of the BMW into the uh, side of the BMW, hitting Tupac. Well, looking at the diagram and considering that we have a stoplight and we have an entourage, which is not good for security, I would say that if this car were not in the lead car, that would still give the middle car an avenue of escape. Then you have the car with the person in it, and then you have their backup. What also I see is this car in the left-hand turn lane, or to the left of the entourage. Obviously, there was talk about four young ladies in a car and that were talked to. Again, they were evasive. They didn't want to say anything much at the time. This appears to be blocking the middle car from pulling over in case of emergency or case of accident. But I'll tell you what, this happens all the time in the Middle East, and this is typical of your assassinations in Colombia, your assassinations in um, some other countries to where the car targeted is blocked in from going left because the other car that pulls up to the right completes the quadrant, completes the silhouette of blocking the middle car in. There's no place for the middle car to go. The middle car is blocked in by the lead car, is blocked in by the car to the left, and is finally blocked in by the right car, which appears to be the shooter in this incident. When I saw the white Cadillac pulling up to uh, Tupac and Shug, you know, I mean, it was no different than any other car that was going to end, you know, come up to a red light and, you know, stop. Only thing different about the Cadillac pulling up is that I noticed that it was getting a little bit closer to the car. No alarm, because there was, you know, other cars pulling up to them and, you know, you know, you know the, the groupie kind of uh, situation. It's obvious that its intent is to block the middle car from going forward, this car from left, and then finally the shooter to the right. It was sitting duck. Sitting duck. Sitting duck. came out, fired into the uh, BMW, and we, myself and the three outlaws that was in the car with me, we are just in awe. And it looked as if everything was in slow motion. I mean, as clear as me sitting here right now talking about it, my memory will always remember. And the way I visioned it was in slow motion, even still now. While I was working at 662, I heard something over the next tells that we all carry for security. And what I heard was, got him. No, that's news to me. The only phones I know of, I think, are all through AT&T. These, these uh, radios that we keep talking about, the next tell uh, telephones, two-way radios, they had pretty much just come into play. Because originally, all we had were the, you know, uh, regular uh, radios just the radio itself and 
probably uh, closer to around the time of us coming out to Las Vegas, around the time frame of uh, Pog being uh, killed, I would say that those uh, Nextel phone radios had just come into play for uh, right-way security. And there was only, uh, it's a guess, there was probably only four or five of them. Okay, but it was enough to go around to the people that mattered that should have had them. The Nextel information is news. The voice was definitely one of our security that works directly for Mr. Knight. Michael Moore, the night that Tupac was shot, after being taken off of Tupac with me, went back over to Club 662. Maybe the police should have concentrated more on death row, the Nextel phone bills, and other things that could have helped them investigate it more in depth. I would definitely look more at death row than I would look at Mr. Anderson, and that's from what I gathered when I was at New York, what I heard Pac tell Suge Knight, and what I heard over that radio that night after the shots were fired. Uh, they got word that Tupac uh, and Suge had been shot. So Michael was with Reggie and they went to the hospital together. And Michael talks about hearing um, um, something over the radio. Well, he would have heard it over Reggie's radio because he wouldn't have had a radio that night. Right before me and Mr. Wright got in the vehicle to go get to the hospital, someone else came on the radio and said, hey, don't say nothing over the radio. That communication, however obtained, either through search warrant or otherwise, needs to be gathered because how can you tell a conspiracy if you don't have the conspirators? and you don't have the communication between the people that are actually running the conspiracy. You've got to know a timeline of the individual who is your target. You've got to know where they're at, where they're going to be, who they're going to be surrounded by. And the second thing is, you know, following that timeline, knowing when there is, you're going to have to plan according to that. Mr. Wright and I were talking about what had happened, and, and, and I just clearly heard somebody say, don't say that over the radio, but the person who said it was not homeboy security, nor was it one of our security guards. It was, to me, a, would be like a stranger. Someone, and the person that said that was Caucasian. Definitely not African American. Nextel sold a push to talk feature, which was essentially a walkie talkie over a cell phone line. With it, conversations could be transmitted via speakerphone. This was how Moore heard the conversation on Wright's cell phone. But was this a random broadcast meant for a wider audience, with Moore and Wright only passive listeners? That's possible now. But what about in 1996? We asked the Sprint Nextel Corporation to comment on the ability to communicate with a group on the Push to Talk feature. My name is Jack Flans. I'm a communications manager for Sprint Nextel. Group talk for the Push to Talk product was not available in 1996 as it is now. So if a Nextel radio broadcast had to be a point-to-point -point conversation and Moore hears the message overwrites Nextel, then only one conclusion remains. Someone with immediate knowledge of the kill called Wright directly. Right after the car sped off, I jumped out of the car and I ran up to the back of the BMW. As I was approaching the BMW, as I got about to the trunk, the car did a U-turn. There's absolutely no way I thought that that car was moving because with all of the rounds that went through that car, they were dead. You know, one of the other elements of planning that's sometimes used and sometimes not is how can we cover up the hit itself? Can we make this look like an accident? Or can we make this look like a random act? Because the best thing an assassin can do is to make it look like it was a random act of violence, that it was not an assassination at all. When the car did a U-turn, the other cars that was with us in the entourage, the car that was in front of Suge and the car that was next to Suge, all did a U-turn. Dubai cops who were in the parking garage right above, on the second floor of the parking garage above the shooting, hear bang, bang, bang. They jump on their bikes, you know, take their bikes downstairs and boom, they're on the scene immediately. So quickly that they're able to follow and then hit their little shoulder radios that, you know, there's been a shooting at, at Colval and Flamingo. Got back over to uh, the Las Vegas uh, Boulevard turned left on Las Vegas Boulevard as he's jumping mediums, he's blowing his tires, you know, messed up his rims and all of that as the pictures show. With this crime scene tape being put around this car, and it happened so fast, like, I can't even believe. 
how fast it was. This tape was up as myself and the Outlaws and the other two uh, guys, which was, uh, you know, with Shook, tried to go uh, into the tape, the crime scene tape. We were told not to, and they, at that point in time, put us down on the curb, put us down in a prone position. And I said to the one cop that I was the bodyguard, and he allowed me to come in. When I got up under the tape, and Suge was laying on the ground in a uh, you know prone position. And I told a cop, I said, he's the CEO of the record label, and that's Tupac in the car. That's when Suge, they let him up off the ground, and Suge and I ran around to the passenger side of the uh, car with the cop, and we were all trying to open the door. And the cop, I mean, Suge said, it's my car, I know how to open the door, you know, whatever. So he opened the door, and that's when, uh, you know, pulled Pac out of the car and laid him on the ground. You have the preliminary crime scene, which has been cordoned off, and usually your forensics are there by now, your paramedics are there by now, everyone is at the preliminary crime scene. And yet both cops, two bicycle cops, not one of them stays at the scene. Both of them leave the scene. The victim's vehicle was two to three vehicles back from the intersection. Uh, the Cadillac pulled up immediately beside them, stopped, and opened fire. Uh, where the car broke down at, there was, all of the cops were right there, and um, there was a lieutenant, and he walked over to me, and we were talking, and I said, it was, I said, that's not the car. It was a white car over there already. It was like a Nissan or something like that, and he was saying that that was uh, the car, and I said, that's not the car. I said, that's not the car. It was a white Cadillac, and he was telling me, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up and we are looking for a suspect vehicle which was described as a white or, or off-white Cadillac, newer model Cadillac. And then another cop walked over to him and said something to him and he just turned and walked away from me. It amazes me that when we have professional bodyguards as part of this entourage that they can't even give us an accurate description of the vehicle. Kevin Manning uh, from Las Vegas uh, PD. He said that uh, no one, no bodyguard could uh, accurately give a description of the uh, white Cadillac. Well, I am the one that said that there was a white Cadillac. So it, right now it appears that the gunshots were fired from the suspect vehicle only, again, which is described as a white or light colored uh, newer Cadillac. Suspect vehicles that have left the scene at a high rate of speed that would draw attention to them. If there are vehicles noted by the witnesses, the preliminary investigator, the preliminary officers and the sergeant, our supervisor on the scene, would issue an all points bulletin describing the vehicle. There are helicopters available um, and, and uh, police headquarters is downtown, which isn't very far, it's just a couple of miles away from where the, the shooting took place. They could have dispatched almost immediately, I'm sure some were on call, almost immediately. If not, news cameras, you know, news crews could have been in the air. And you know, our, our standards operating procedure, or procedure that we follow, is basically that. If we have a witness came forward and say, I saw this, it was this type of vehicle, the first thing we're going to do is get on the radio and start having every agency in the area look for that vehicle. Put out the word, this is what we're looking for, this is a vehicle of interest that could be considered armed and dangerous. Let's find this vehicle because that is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle that we need to put in place. It just didn't feel like a typical murder investigation. I mean, my God, the biggest man in rap, you know, was killed. And yet they were acting, you know, I hate to use this word, but it felt lackadaisical. This is the vehicle we want. This was the last direction of travel that we were, that, that is known to us. They could have closed I-15. They could have, I mean, they'll close it for an accident not even leave a, a small accident, not even leave a lane open for motorists. So it's not like they're worried about the motorist. They could have closed I-15, they could have closed the strip, they could have walled the place off. You had Nevada Highway Patrolmen on, you know, on, on extra duty. You had Metro Police on overtime working. It's a Tyson fight. And being intent on looking for that particular vehicle, on sitting on the side of the road, waiting for that vehicle to drive past them. But at the same time, you give the description, the direction of travel that you know of, you're going to have many agencies start to look for that particular vehicle to cover those roadways. That state line, the Nevada Highway Patrol, has an office that's manned. And so all they ha would have to do is radio 30 to 40 minutes away 
that's how long it would take to get to the state line. They could have roadblocked that thing so fast it wouldn't have been funny. Matt, I don't think the police really care, to be honest with you. I don't think nobody really cares. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police also has um, a sub office at the airport. So the airport police, Metro Police, already on the scene at the airport, could have been on alert for, you know, uh, the shooter coming out of there too. Whether it's some type of diversion tactic to take their uh, attention away, to let them drop their guard for a moment, up into the point of how you're going to get out there after the hit. Now, them looking for the Cadillac and doing the things that they should have done to find that Cadillac, obviously they weren't fast enough and didn't get uh, you know, to finding it because it was never found. Compton police claimed to have identified this Cadillac as the shooter's vehicle. It was a rental car the only white Cadillac rented in Los Angeles that weekend. Las Vegas police claimed they never received that information. Because obviously, you gotta understand, I came into this cold. In fact, I was woke up to go do the investigation. The protocol for the preliminary investigators at a crime scene are to gather as many witnesses as possible. If a witness is not cooperative, then they should be placed under arrest for that moment as a material witness or hindering an investigation of a police officer. Those guys are sitting right next to each other and they're talking to each other. And you have, never have witnesses to a crime sit there and sit with each other. You isolate them, you take them to a holding cell, put them in different cells. They've got room especially for that. But the prime players, the secondary level players, they should be all isolated so as not uh, to experience misinformation effect or to give uh, false information or to uh, congeal their information into one witness. When the detectives arrived, and uh, Detective Becker at the time was a homicide detective on a case, um, he took us individually one at a time into his, his car and uh, started talking to us. As he was trying to talk to us and to, you know, get answers, I don't think, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I'm gonna speak for myself, that I was in a clear state of mind to answer him, period. Because all of this stuff is running through my head. Frank Alexander, who was Tupac's bodyguard, who was driving the car behind him, was uh, someone we interviewed. I just saw my friend get shot, and not only him being my friend, I'm the bodyguard, I'm supposed to be protecting him, and I couldn't do anything. You know, no one would have been able to do anything, but the fact is, myself nor anyone else were in a frame of mind to answer any kind of questions at that particular point in time. Again, people were evasive, didn't want to say much of anything. everything that they know. And um, it was basically the police talking as if they were at the mercy of the, the people who, who were witnesses to the case. That, oh well, they won't talk to us, so, and Shug Knight won't talk to us, we haven't talked to him yet, um, he won't return our calls. I was never interviewed by any of the police agencies, the FBI, nor Las Vegas PD, and I found that to be a little strange because for the last week, I was with Tupac and I, got a, I didn't get a single question from anyone about what I thought, what the th my theory was on what happened, nor about the next telephones where I had heard the conversation that said, God. No interviews. This is my first any kind of interview. It was the DA's office, but by no, any other federal agencies now. These people would be, should be isolated and transported, whether they wanted to or not, to the police station uh, because they're material witnesses. He's going to have to make some very difficult choices. One of those difficult choices, does he want to put his freedom on the line not to cooperate? In other words, are we going to have to take him into custody for obstructing an investigation? We're going to need to take him back and do what we need to do to interview him. Bodyguards, because of their association and close association to whom they're guarding, you know, they're privy to things being said, things being seen that they may normally keep to themselves but in this situation could actually lead 
to an identification of a suspect or suspects. So bodyguards are a prime source of information. So I don't know how you can say, how the police can say that that's not cooperation when they weren't even approached, they're just sitting in the waiting room. And if they're willing to give information, then a detective who neglects going for that information is losing a lot of valuable leads in this type of investigation. I was there in Vegas when he was shot. It doesn't matter whether you're bodyguards or you're a housemaid or you're a butler, you're privy to information which is crucial and you may keep it to yourself but at the at a certain juncture these things become paramount these things become crucial the conversations that are overheard the conversations that are had that need to come forward because this is the first time i ever dealt with any kind of music industry uh case like this and i it was a learning curve for me as far as how everything was done and it was very very confusing to me how things were kind of just done haphazardly. Yafufula was a name that a lot of people have thrown back in our faces that we were derelict in doing things. Yafu Fula was interviewed the night of the shooting. Yafu Fula gave a statement. People say we never interviewed him. He was interviewed. And the uh, big thing is everybody says that he said he could identify the shooter. No, he did not. He never said that to us. He said he might be able to identify the driver. That is what he said. We tried to re-interview him. The problem was, this is a big country. People go wherever, you know, we don't have tracking devices on them. So we have to depend on people that we know we can get in touch with to, go, to try and reach out to them. Malcolm Greenidge said he could identify the shooter. We finally track him down to set up a re-interview. And he says, I'm not going to look at any photos because I can't identify him. Yeah, we got beat up in the LA Times over that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, put up or shut up, Ace. And, well, he, but again, Reggie Wright Jr. is the one that brought him to that interview. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know very little about Marion Suge Knight's partner in business. There are no pictures of this man circulating on the internet. He's a man in the shadows. That man's name is Reginald Wright Jr. Reggie Wright Jr. was clearly at the middle of the entire orchestration of the assassination, to be sure. However, one must look at the other elements that would have been involved. Reggie Wright Jr. was a former Compton police officer. His record as a police officer was short and unremarkable. Reggie Wright used to work for Compton PD, yes. I know he had some type of medical retirement. Running Rightway Security, he was not working for Compton PD. I have no relationship with Reggie Wright at this time, nor do I plan to. My impression, my opinion of Reggie Wright Jr. was He's employed by Death Row Records uh, to do a certain job. He's going to do what his employer has him do. He's going to divulge what they want released to the police and withhold things that maybe they don't want released. Reggie is not honest. And I want to leave it at that. One of Reggie's problems was that Reggie didn't have the executive protection background that we all had. But the difference between, I would say, the team and myself and Frank is Frank and I would speak up about it. You know, we would say, 
hey, Reggie, you know, you should do it this way and this is why. Or you should do it this way and this is why. And I think he was so busy being the boss that his, his, his employees couldn't tell him how or what to do when all we were trying to do was educate him a little bit in how you do this or how you do that regarding executive protection matters. Uh, matters. And it was kind of sad to us because, like Frank said, we had such a tight team that Mr. Wright and us could have gone places. We've, we've, we could have did a lot of things. We could have made a lot of money together, but he was too busy not wanting to be educated, per se, on, on particular issues that we were well experienced in that he was not. But if it was, if it seemed as if myself or Frank were trying to tell him, you know, what he could or, or couldn't do, then he wasn't hearing it. And that was the end of that. So there was a lot that we never got done that we could have gotten done professionally. I, I guess the way to sum Reggie up is he was just selfish. His childhood friendship with Knight was one part of the attraction. But he had one asset that made a relationship with him even more attractive. His father. Reggie Wright Sr. was on the Compton Police Department's gang detail and is still employed by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Unlike the notorious reputation of his son, Reggie Wright Sr. has remained a well-respected and revered member of the Compton Police scene. His father's status as a conduit to the gang population may have given Reggie Jr. a unique first-hand relationship with the same gang leaders that knew his father. If that's not a conflict of interest, I've never heard one. Suge Knight, also from Compton, may have seen the opportunity to use Wright's network to his advantage. He would know. He grew up there. A shrewd business move indeed. In my opinion, Reggie Wright Sr. should have excluded himself from the investigation immediately because it's an obvious conflict of interest. And it was a mistake not to do that. The fact that Reggie Wright Sr. and Reggie Wright Jr. are involved in this case, uh, in my mind at least, creates a classic conflict of interest. And it's something that anyone looking at this case, I think, should be aware of. I was told that normally Tupac or body armor in public. He wasn't doing that. And the way it was put to me is that I guess he was told not to wear it. Now, I don't know why. Could Reggie Wright make that sort of call and use death row resources for that effort? Apparently so. In these court documents, we learn that Wright was not only the acting general manager for death row, but was also agent of record for death row records. You're suing a corporation, at least in the state of Ohio, and I think just about every other jurisdiction, you have to have some person to serve process on. And that person, again, in the state of Ohio, is someone that's designated, and uh, the record is on file at the Secretary of State's office as to the person who the service would be placed upon. These lawsuit transcripts also show that Wright had the authority of managing witnesses and financial arrangements on Knight's behalf. We also know that Wright had the off-duty police departments of Los Angeles, Compton, and Las Vegas at his disposal. If this seems to be a lot of responsibility and power, consider the fact that Wright was in charge of security for death row's most valuable asset at the time. Shakur was killed while Wright was in charge, and he was given a promotion when most security agents would not have a job. Or was he always in charge? just under Suge Knight. We now know that Reggie lied tonight, including what happened that night and his own instruction. But I'm going to add something to that. We were also instructed to lie by Reggie Wright to Suge. And the reason we were instructed to lie was because Reggie Wright told us not to carry any weapons. Suge called a meeting and all the artists were instructed to come to this meeting and certain security was invited and I happened to be one of them. But prior to going into the meeting with Suge and all the artists from Death Row, Reggie met with us out front in his own meeting and instructed us to say certain things. And when I got into the meeting, it was a meeting based, the meeting was basically about what happened. And the artists were drilling security about what methods we had used and what were some of our tactics. At that time, Suge wasn't even aware that I was still doing security. Um, Reggie had taken me 
to a um, another job that he was doing at a church, uh, securing a uh, church up in uh, Inglewood from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I looked around and no one said it. No one was speaking up for security. So I seen it was more, and I've been in these type of meetings before, uh, even at the fire station. It's almost like a similar to a political type meeting of, of, of far the higher, you know, of what was going on. So I was one of the few people that spoke up and said, wait a minute, we were instructed not to carry weapons. And none of the artists knew that. They didn't know we were instructed not to carry weapons that day. And it looked like Reggie wasn't going to say that information to them. So I spoke up and said, no, we were instructed not to carry weapons that day. And that's why no one in security, with probably at the exception of me, had a weapon. So Suge wasn't even aware that I was still working with Right Way. I remember uh, Michael uh, <clears throat> asking me, or telling me rather, I'm sorry, telling me that um, Reggie had told Suge that I was no longer working with uh, Right Way Security. And I would have uh, wondered what he would have uh, done or how he would have felt to have known that I was still working for Right Way all the way up until uh, the end of November. The fact that Reggie Wright senior is a police lieutenant who apparently was involved in this case uh, is the father of Reggie Wright Jr. who as I understand it was the head of security for Death Row Records creates a huge conflict of interest and the fact that uh, that the elder Mr. Wright is referred to in the affidavit for the search warrant I think in some ways would taint that search warrant at a minimum it should have been brought out in the body of that affidavit for the search warrant, the relationship between the parties. It would have been helpful for the judge reviewing that application or affidavit for a search warrant to know that. The greatest lie the devil ever told was, he doesn't exist. Oh, I was regularly, regularly, you know, contacting the police and I had sources within the police department saying, hey, they don't want, they don't want this thing to go to trial. You know, uh, it, all these gangster rappers would come to town. It would be bad publicity for Metro uh, and for the city. It would be bad for tourism and, you know, I, I guess justice, you know, comes second to tourism. But um, at least that's what I was being told from within. And these are sources, you know. Uh, but basically, it was buttoned up at the police department. Uh, I mean, I, they would talk.